you uh, have your Bible, would you open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians? We're going to be in Ephesians for, the ne- for this Sunday and two more, and then we're going to be in the book of Philippians for two months. So uh, we're going we're gonna to get through it. My wife's leaving with, with Elias Malky's daughter who's here visiting. They're going to make tacos. Amen. Everyone say you praise the Lord. Just, I told her, I said, if you leave, I'm going to point you out. Uh, the new you is what I want to talk about today out of Ephesians chapter 4. How many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution to gain weight or get in shape? Come on, more hands. I'm sorry, gain weight. Well, that was me. I'm skinny. I gain weight. You guys want to lose weight. I, now I know why nobody's hands went up. We said, <laughs> how many of you want to lose weight and, and get in shape? Well, great, more hands. I was up at 2 in the morning one time, and I saw this machine uh, coming right around the new year, and it had the little bars that came up, and you connected to them, and you worked out with it. It was called the Bowflex. How many remember that? <laughs> Man, I bought that thing. I got it home, and I set it up, and I, I started working out on it. You know, like I just had one of the bars, you know, and I was like, you won, two. And then I was like, oh, this is terrible. This is work. I don't want to do this. So it became the place where we hung our clothes. It really did. You know the rods that, are, that you hang? Literally, you'd walk in our bedroom, there's a Bowflex with jackets on every one of those things. What an expensive coat hanger. And then about a year later, I was 2 o'clock in the morning watching TV, and Chuck Norris comes on. And he's talking about this, I think it was the total gym, I think is what they call it. And so I got the total gym at my house. I was like, yes, this is awesome. How hard can it be? You're on a piece of board with roller skates, and you're gliding. I mean, it's going to be easy. I worked out on it one time. And then what it turned into is I turned it towards our television, and um, that's where I laid and ate and watched television was on my total gym. <laughs> There's always a, in, in, for us to press to be better, right? I've been at the gym, and I go, I, I'm a member at the gym, and I don't go there very often, but when I do, you always hear people, they're like, and I don't mean to do the lady voice, but there's always ladies like, this is going to be my year. I'm going to be in shape, and I'm beautiful. I'm going to be smart. And I'm going, that's really cool. But, but what about you in the inside? Jesus said to the Pharisees, he says, hey, you guys are great, but you have a problem. You look really good on the outside, but the cup, the inside of you is dirty. And so the world basically has a way of putting band-aids on everything to make us look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're dying. Has anybody ever experienced that before? I look good, I get out of my nice car, I got the makeup and the deal, and I'm awesome, and people think I'm cool, but when you go home, you go, oh, I'm dying on the inside. Well, if you're a believer, if you love Jesus, according to Ephesians, you have become new. And there's a newness of life that we're supposed to walk in, and most of us, I would gather to say, a large percentage of believers don't walk in this newness of life, they actually walk in their old life. They're born again, dragging a dead man around. In other words, you've been crucified with Christ, and you just keep living in that sin. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how do, how do we get the new man to come out and be who we are and how we live. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, I'm going to pray <coughs> real quick. Lord, thank you for the word. I pray today that you would speak to hearts, that you would speak to lives. And we love you, Lord. I pray you'd renew our minds today with the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say, therefore, then testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. In other words, don't walk like those who don't know Jesus. That's what he's saying. You're in Christ. You should, you should walk differently. In the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he goes on to say this, therefore put away lying, speak the truth to one another, don't be angry. He says, actually, he doesn't say don't be angry. He says, in your sin or, or in your anger, do not sin. Because we're going to feel impulses of, of, of anger. You ever gotten angry? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, that, that emotion is not a bad thing. It's what we do with that anger that matters. And Paul's saying, so stop it and don't give place to the devil. 
Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has a need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which uh, you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you in Christ. Watch this. I have seen the last two verses. There's In the church, I've seen about a 50-50. People who are bitter, angry, gossiping, backbiting, slandering, and then people that are being kind to one another. Here's the problem. The problem really is this, is that we don't understand what happened to us the day we gave our hearts to Jesus. We know we came to a church, and, or maybe at home, or a concert or something, and you gave your heart to Jesus, but you don't understand the transaction that happened from heaven into your life. You go, wow, I feel different. I feel, I feel good. I feel like I've, I've, I've been forgiven. But then there's this old pattern that you start going back to. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever felt that? Like, I'm a Christian. Why does this stuff keep coming up in my life? So look at Romans real quick. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stop right there. Most of us spend 90% of our time focusing on consider yourselves uh, uh, dead to sin. We spend a lot of time on that. And this is how a lot of Christians do it. Ready? Oh, my gosh. I remember when I used to have fun. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. Can't do that. Can't do that. Oh, I'm just, I'm just going to be miserable for Jesus and reckon myself dead to sin. And Well, that looks fun. Watch, because we don't focus on part two of the verse, which is the promise, which is the greater thing in that verse. But consider yourself alive. To who? To God. So watch this. Reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. This is the place where I want to spend my time. Because my flesh and your flesh, our sinful nature, will keep us busy and distracted trying to get better. Instead of just receiving who we are in Christ Jesus and walking out that in our life. Amen? So we're dead to sin. Present yourself, the Bible says, watch. What you present yourself to wins. So in the morning when you wake up and that sinful nature is right there, did you know that your flesh does not need coaxing or any type of coaching to be the flesh? You don't got to get up in the morning and go, oh, come on, bad attitude. <laughs> come on. Come on, negative person. Rise up. Did you know that comes super easy? All I have to do in order to walk in that is just wake up in the morning. And just, my eyes open up and my flesh is right there going, I want to be in a bad mood. I'm angry. I'm negative. I don't like this. I don't like that. And the Bible says, Paul said this about himself. I, I love the way he says this. Paul says, I beat my flesh and I make it my slave. And I would submit that most of us are a slave to our flesh. And the spiritual things of God, we don't invest much time into. We spend 90% of our time on the flesh. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Oh, man, I'm, I'm struggling. Oh, and I'm, oh, God. ah, the sin's got me. Instead of doing this when you wake up in the morning, this is Paul. Shut up, flesh. You're going to drag, listen, you're going to drag this flesh through your whole life until Jesus comes or you go to heaven. You're dragging around your old man. The Bible says this, that we have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's a new life. Watch this. I'm a new person in Christ. And so when sin comes knocking at my door, I'm dead. You can't give a dead man a ticket. You can't entice a dead man. I remember right after I got saved, I read that verse. <clears throat> I remember I was a long-haired kid and did things you probably shouldn't have done. And this guy came up to me who knew me from the year before, and he goes, hey, man, you want to smoke some weed? And I just read that verse that morning. You are dead to sin. And I just looked at my buddy, and I went, I'm dead. And he freaked out on me. He goes, what? And I go, are you high right now? And he goes, yeah. So I go, you're tripping right now, aren't you? He goes, yeah. And I go, no, I'm not dead like that. I'm dead to sin. He goes, oh, man, I was freaking out. I thought I was dead. And I was like, okay, well, just calm down. <clears throat> 
my flesh was, was tempted by something that used to have me, and my old man was wanting to come down off the cross and live again. But I reckoned him. I said, no, 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 I'm crucified with Christ. This new person, this new life, I am walking with Jesus from now on. That is what I'm about. I reckon myself dead indeed to sin. Now watch this. Therefore do not let sin, verse 12, Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Remember last uh, couple weeks ago when I talked about today <clears throat> in a lot of college circles, this gospel is out there that says, Jesus loves you, do whatever you want. You can sin, you can sleep around, you can party. It doesn't matter because God already loves you and there's nothing you can do to impress him. So you can do whatever you feel like doing. Apparently, they've never read Romans chapter 6 before. Because Romans chapter 6 says, sin should not have dominion over you. It doesn't say that we're not going to struggle and battle. It just says this is not going to have dominion over you. Its claws are not going to have you. But I love what it says, because you're not under law, but because you're under grace. Watch this. The grace of God that we enjoy when he saves us is the same grace that empowers us to live righteous. My struggling with sin is not that I'm eking it out. Watch this. If I'll turn my eyes from consider yourself crucified with Christ, I, I mean uh, dead to sin, and I make this part of the verse what I'm after, and that's this. I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus. If I'll enjoy God's grace, if I'll enjoy the love of God, if I'll walk with him, pray, and worship, I'll spend less time <clears throat> worrying about what my sinful man wants all the time. That sinful dude will keep you busy, tormented, completely, always, always like, I'm a bad Christian. You know what? Focus your eyes on Jesus and his grace, and you'll start to see that stuff shed off of you. I've said to you before, if you take a noose and you put it, we used to try to catch birds in a box out on our property when I was a kid. You ever did that with the, with the box and the stick? Remember that? And then you put the little lasso thing inside where the bird's going to stand, and when he stands in there, you pull the lasso, and it grabs him by his feet. You ever, you ever, no? <laughs> our family was crazy, I guess. We never caught one. Because, I mean, what bird's going to be like, oh, look, the box with the stick and a little kid holding the thing. You know what I'm saying? But I know this, that once you grab an animal with a, with, with a noose like that, the more they struggle, the more they get caught. The more you fight and struggle, actually, the tighter it gets. You see, the more we focus on our sins, our problems, our brokenness, our trouble, the more we focus on that, the actually more miserable we become. When I enjoy the grace of God and I wake up in the morning and my flesh wants what it wants and I say, no, 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 I'm going to submit to God. I'm going to love Jesus. I'm going to read the word. I know I have a past. I know I have issues. And the enemy's always trying to remind me, but I'm going to come before the Lord. Watch this. I'm going to bring my brokenness to him, my trouble to him. And when I process my brokenness and my trouble in the grace of God, it becomes life to me. But if I refuse to bring my brokenness and trouble before the Lord and I only live in the flesh and work on it in the flesh and I become self-righteous and I actually become, it actually becomes death. We're supposed to enjoy the benefits and the blessings of God. You are under grace. I want to read to you in Ephesians 4. We just read it because this is what we're going to look at today. And then we're going to read one more portion of scripture and we're going to get into something I guarantee is going to change your heart. Ephesians 4.20 says this, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct the old man which goes corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. What does that mean? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, putting on, watch this, true righteousness that comes from God, according to God. What does that mean? religious spirit does this. A religious spirit does this. I got born again. I'm saved. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to make myself better. And I'm going to become self-righteous. And I'm going to walk around. You see, the reason why I, there was Christians that early on in my life that acted like they were better than everybody and just criticized everybody. Do you know sinners know they're sinners? You don't have to walk up to somebody and go, hey man, you know you're going to hell for smoking like that. That's stupid. 
It's a bad way to start a conversation about the love of God, isn't it? And listen, man, th- these, these mean Christians would come at me, and, w- and one day there was these two girls in our, my freshman year. Their names were Tammy Brandt and Tammy Harper, and one I'm still connected with and know the other one I, I, I've lost touch with, but they were two Christian girls. They were about this tall, and they would walk over to the table that our heavy metal guys were hanging out on, and they would walk over literally holding hands. You ever seen the movie The Shining? It was kind of <laughs> like that. It was kind of weird. Uh, it was kind of weird. And then they would just walk up to me and go, hi, Rick. I'm sitting at the table with my hair. And they're like, hey, Rick, we just wanted to tell you that we're praying for you every day. And they're like, okay. And then the next day, hey, Rick, we prayed for you today. And God has a plan for your life. He really wants to do something through you. And he, wants, he just loves you. Cool, man, thanks. You know, they did that every day. Every day. They just walk over to me. I don't even think they wanted to towards the end. And one day when I gave my heart to Christ, you should have seen the joy on their face when I saw them my sophomore year. They were so lit up with joy. They came up to me and they were like, yeah. And I was like, I never knew. But you know what? Thank you for being lovers of God that are kind to people instead of just coming. They never once said that your long hair is terrible. The music you listen to is bad. They never said anything about the things I was doing. They just told me about the love of God. That's what God has called us to. And when we enjoy the grace of God and we walk in that, it changes people's lives. So how do you renew this up here, the new man that's been created according to God? See, when you walk in self-righteousness, that's you. And the Bible says that's your self-righteousness. Your righteousness is filthy rags. But God's righteousness, watch this, is created according to God. Well, what does that mean? That means when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, that his blood is perfect. So that's the perfect thing before God. And we are in that and we walk in that. And so how do we renew this up here? How do we go from I'm going to resist this thing that's had me to I'm going to enjoy God? I'll tell you what. How many of you love cinnamon bears? You know what a cinnamon bear is? Oh, you, you guys aren't living. <laughs> I'm on a thing, and I've been on a thing for about 11 months now where I no soda, no candy, no desserts. That's what I'm doing. Because my flesh, if I gave my flesh everything it wanted to eat, I'd have trouble. How many of you know I'd probably have a heart problem when I'm older? And so I've been, re- I've been for 10 months, 11 months resisting this. And Corey, uh, Pastor Corey, Pastor Tyler, Pastor Justin, and I go away twice a year to pray, uh, plan, and play. And we just got back Friday. We were gone for three or four days. And there is this hotel, uh, or this mall, where I knew they had cinnamon bears and this, this, this uh, licorice you dip in this white chocolate stuff. And it's It's evil. And I remember, and I said to the guys, it was kind of, you know, towards the evening, I go, guys, and I haven't been eating this stuff. I go, I want the licorice with the white chocolate. <laughs> so we go to the mall to go find this store, and we walk in, and, and the store is gone. <laughs> yeah, no, don't clap. It's, it's unholy. <laughs> don't even clap. And so I, I literally am like, I go over to the store. It's diamond rings now. And I was like, hey, hey. The guy's like, hey, buddy, you getting married? And I was like, I've been married for 27 years. I want the licorice. Where's the licorice? And, the, and he goes, oh, yeah, I think they moved. And so I walk out to this food court, and there's a girl sitting in one of those kiosk things. And I'm like, hey, remember the licorice store there that made the white stuff? She goes, oh, yeah, yeah, they moved. And I go, where are they, in the mall? And she says, no, no, they're not in the mall. I don't know where they moved to. And I was like, wow. And so she's looking on her phone. We're trying to remember the name, and she starts going through all this stuff. And so it's been 15 minutes. We're trying to figure out. I go, all right. Gave her a high five and said, good, good try. And we're walking through the hallway. We're going down through the store. We're in Barnes & Nobles, and this hand reaches over and hits me on the back. And I, go, I turn around. It's the girl from the thing. <laughs> she's got her phone out, and she's like, I know where the licorice is, but I left my spot, so you have to follow me back. So she takes off running through the mall to get back to her spot, and all four of us are behind her. Just, we want the licorice. <clears throat> and so she says, here's where it is. It's at the JW Marriott. So as we're getting ready to leave, we have 30 minutes to get to the J-Dub. 30 before it closes, the store. So I, I say to the little girl, thank you. You're awesome. 
And as I go to turn away, the Lord says, do you think that little girl runs after every customer like that? And I said, no, what are you trying to say? And he says, take advantage of this moment. This, I'm doing something. And I was like, oh, no, we're going to miss the licorice. <laughs> we're going mi- <clears throat> to miss the licorice. Miss- and my flesh, my flesh was starting to sweat. It was, I was thinking about the licorice that I haven't had forever. And my spirit man's going, make this moment count. So I said, hey, thank you so much. It's so awesome. High-fived her again and said, what's your name? And she told me her name. I said, how old are you? And I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she goes, I'm grown up. I'm 21. I go, never mind. I, I didn't mean that, but this is what I want to do with my life. And I said, well, let me tell you something. I don't think it's a coincidence that you and I had this conversation. You chased us out of the mall, and now we're back standing here together. I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm a lover of God. And God changed my life, and he gave me a future And I will tell you that if you will love him and you will walk with him and you will give your life to him, that you will have the best life ever. And she says, well, I went to the church once. I said, what church did you go to? She says, I went to the Mormon church. I said, well, no wonder you had a bad time. (laughs) And she she says, what do you mean? I says, the false gospel, man. She stares at me. I said, I'm not talking about some religious thing that you get connected to and you start going through the motions. I'm talking about the Son of God who gave his life for you, who loves you and cares for you. And now, you know when people start to get a little nervous and then maybe a little teary-eyed? So, five minutes till the place closes. We're never going to make it. That's what I'm thinking. My flesh, watch this. Your flesh will make sure that you miss every opportunity with the Lord. And we're supposed to reckon it dead. And those cinnamon bears, too. They're demonic. <laughs> I love them. And you know what? I got to resist them when they come my way. You know, my flesh. I'm like, my flesh just wants to eat what it wants. My flesh wants to have what it wants. And I resist it when it comes my way. Why? Not because I'm holy, but because I don't want to have heart problems when I'm 65. Yeah? I want to do my part. And so I want to parallel that into your life, that your flesh just gets up in the morning and says, give me, give me. And if you'll enjoy the Lord and walk in the new you, God will do amazing things in you and through you. But you have to decide to do that. How do we do that? We renew this, the way we think. Look at this. I'm going to close with this. In Numbers uh, chapter 13, verse 1, we all know the story. Israel uh, were slaves for 400 years to Egypt. Remember that story? <clears throat> if you saw, like, you know, the prince of Egypt and all those things, and you kind of get it a little bit. And so God moves the children of Israel out of Egypt. They were slaves for 400 years. Now, please hear me. They had a slave mind, even though they were free. They were free, watch, they were free to move about and to go into the promised land, but they had a slave mind. Matter of fact, the Bible says that if the Lord had taken taken them on the right route to get them into the promised land, if the Lord had taken them there first, it probably would have took about two weeks. But the Lord said, I couldn't do that because it would have killed them. Literally, they probably would have never gotten to the promised land. So the Lord had to take him on the 40-year route. How many of you know there was probably a dude driving? <clears throat> I, I know where I'm going, ladies. Like, I've seen those bushes over there 50 times. It's been 20 years, Bob. What are you doing? Why did the Lord do that? I'll tell you why. Because he was getting a slave mind out of them so they would think like sons and like daughters of God. And a lot of us think like slaves. We're carrying this dead guy around with us and we're, we feel like that's what we focus on is the problems instead of the promise. Watch this. Numbers chapter 13 verse 1. I'm going to bounce around a bit in this. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out uh, men to spy out the land of Canaan which I'm going to give to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone, a leader among them. And so he does, he, he, he does that. He says, I want to send, so there's 12 guys that go and spy out the land that they're going to go take. Watch right here. Look right here. They've been eating oatmeal, let's just say, for 40 years, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And these guys go in, and they spy out the land, and they come back with a bushel of grapes on a pole, and two guys are carrying it. 
This is how serious it was. And they're like, oh man, it's dripping with, with honey and milk and Man, there's Taco Bells everywhere. I mean, it's amazing. And everyone's going, yeah, sweet, we're going there, we're going there. Here, w- watch what happens. In verse 28, nevertheless, the people who dwell in that land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. If you go down to verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. And then it goes on to say that the ten spies said, no, no, no. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. These guys are huge. We'll never get in. Caleb and Joshua said, wait, I remember a time when God opened the Red Sea up and drowned our enemies. I remember a time when, rock, when, when, it, when, when Moses struck a rock and water came out of it. You're telling me that God can't overcome these people and give us the things that he's promised? You see, 10 of them had a slave mind. Two of them had son minds. They were sons of God. Ten forgot who they were and their identity as people of God. And two said, no, I know who we are in Christ Jesus. I know who we are in the Father. I know who we are in God. See, the problem is the ten are the majority, aren't they? And I wrote this down in my notes. The majority was, was completely wrong. Just like today in our society. Well, we voted on it, and so therefore it makes it right. No, it doesn't make it right before the Lord. The majority can be way, way off. In the, to, uh, according to the things of God. And so Caleb quieted the people. And I want you to catch this. Your life can be either a life that quiets people or causes them to quit. Because 10 people stood up and said, we can't do it. Watch this. They had the gall to bring in all this fruit and tacos and all this good stuff. And people have been eating oatmeal for 40 years. And they, they showed them the promise and then said, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, we can't do it. They, the ten said it can't be done, and two said it can be done, and it will be done. See, the problem is even in the church, and Paul talks about it a lot, there's got to be unity, because here's the problem. It only takes a few people to mess something up, doesn't it? Our flesh doesn't have to be riled up to be gossipy. It's just natural. Watch this. This is how it works. Hey, come here. Come here for that. You're using your mouth and your words to poison the water. And then you get seven people and eight people, 14 people, 25 people, 30 people, and in a church they start talking and slandering. Why? Because they, they've never learned how to crucify their flesh and how to walk in the newness of life in Christ Jesus. So the very thing that they are out there in the streets, they come into the church and go, hey, I'm going to be gossipy, slandering, I don't agree with this, and I'm going to let my opinion be known. And watch this, it starts to poison the camp and then the church doesn't reach its full potential in Christ. And Paul says, I beat my flesh every day and I make it my slave. And I tell you, we have to watch our mouth because we can, we, with our words we can make people quit or we can make people quiet down and we can help them grow and come to the things of God, right? So you have to choose today what one of those guys are going to be. The Bible says of, of Joshua and Caleb that they had a different spirit on them than the other ten. And I ask myself all the time, Lord, what spirit do I have? Because I know the potential of me. I know what I can be like. So, Lord, I want to be like Joshua and Caleb. I want to have a different spirit on me. I want you to look from heaven and go, that guy right there, I trust him. I can go to battle with him because he believes that I can do it. I say to you, God has a plan for this church that's bigger than any of us have ever known. And some of you are here in what would, would, would be considered the church's heyday when it was, I don't know, 2,500 people or whatever it was. And the sign of a healthy church is that its dreams are bigger than its memories. I, w- I was on staff at a church that went from 400 people to 2,800. And I remember all those wonderful times, and guess what? That church is still doing wonderful and great. And did you know for a while there was people in the church, well, I remember when our youth pastor was Rick Fry and this was happening. And I show up and I, and I tell those people, hey, stop it. Let's do what God's doing today and quit worrying about what happened yesterday and what was. I don't want to live on yesterday's bread. What God did then is over. God wants to do something here. And I want us to be people that have a renewed mind that think like God does instead of thinking and letting our flesh do what it wants, yeah? Listen to these two verses. Galatians 2.20 says this. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What do I do? I live in Christ. Acts 17, 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being. 
In him we live and move and have our being. I was watching the Warriors game. And how many of you know that I'm not a sports guy? But I used to watch a lot of basketball. And when Michael Jordan left the game, I stopped watching basketball. And I went to a Warriors game with Scooter Barry. And I got to meet the team. And I said, these are some nice guys. I love these guys. They're not just good basketball players, but they're really cool. And so I started watching them on TV, but now I record their games. And I have a Warriors shirt that I put on when the game's on. <laughs> I get up, and I, you know, I'm like, come on! And I sat down to watch a game that had been recorded, and I push play. First two minutes of the game, we're getting whomped. And I'm yelling at the TV, that's not how you do it, Thompson! That's not how you play. And so what I did is I fast-forwarded it all the way. I covered my eyes and fast-forwarded to the end of the game. <laughs> I did. I went all the way to the end. And I got to the fourth quarter in the last two minutes, and I watched it. And guess what? We won by 17 points. So you know what I did? I rewound it. <laughs> and I started from minute two again, and I watched the game with a completely different attitude. I was sitting there just... Oh, man, look, our guys threw the ball away again. Oh, it's a great turnover. Oh, good miss there. And then the other team's making their layups. And I go, oh, you guys think you're all fancy-pantsy because you made a layup. <laughs> and I'm, in the, I'm, I'm watching it with such a different perspective because why? Because I knew the end. I was like, we win. Get that smirk off your face there. You made that three-point shot. It ain't going to help you. You lose. <laughs> Watch this. Just as I'm sitting there doing that, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to start living your life like this. Because you're always living your life as a, that failure, the two minutes you played bad, that bad quarter of your life, that bad half of your life. But what you don't know, son, and what you don't focus on, you spend so much time worrying about the free throw you missed in life and the three-pointer you missed in life and all the issues of your life. But what you don't know is that I have overcome the world and you are mine. And when we get to the fourth quarter, we win, period. It doesn't matter what anything else looks like. Amen? We win. I, I, I fast-forwarded in my Bible to the book of Revelation to chapter 21, and I read it, and I was like, ah, oh, we win. Oh, well, I missed a free throw. Oh, geez, this happened. Oh, this bad thing happened. And God sees us in our sorrow. He sees us in our pain. He sees us in our struggle. But guess what? He looks at it differently than we do. He goes, don't worry. The devil, he doesn't win. It may look like he's winning now with ISIS and all that they're doing over there. Right? You ever get riled up about that? My brother, Special Forces, he called me the other day. He's 52. He called me the other day. He says, hey, I think I'm going to join one of those Blackwater teams and go over to Syria and start whomping on some dudes. And in my heart, I'm going, I want to go with you. <laughs> right, let's go take down some guys that are killing children. He said, I, I, I was okay with it until they started killing kids. And then it made me mad. Now I want to go shoot them. And I was like, okay, bye. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, you're, you're freaky. You're a different man than I am. But listen, we get so wound up. Stuff's going on in life. Why is this happening and that happening? And here's what we got to do. Look up and say, I know who wins. I've seen the end. I've read it. You see, my flesh doesn't win. That problem that's always angsting you, anybody have that issue? Does anybody have something that just hangs on to you? Raise your hand. More hands, please. <laughs> Guess what? That thing doesn't win. It loses. It's just fighting you now. And you know how you fight it? You consider it dead. And you enjoy being alive in God. And you focus your heart on the new you instead of the old you. Because the old you is out of shape. Love handles. It's broken. But the new you in Christ Jesus is perfect. Put your focus and attention there. Amen? Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you, and I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for the promise of your word. I thank you, Lord, that every struggle and everything Romans says, that when we get there, these light afflictions won't even be worthy to be compared to the glory that we're going to experience. 
And so, Father, I thank you for every person here, and I ask you to encourage them today. And may we learn to enjoy you and enjoy your benefits and enjoy who we are in your Son. Because the only way out of the snare is to live in grace. Everything else is bondage. And so, Father, would you bless your people today? Would you fill them with your Holy Spirit? God, would you give us wisdom? Would you give us grace to resist and to live for you? And Lord, we thank you that in the end, we win anyways. And so, Lord, help us to keep our eyes on that prize. With all eyes closed, I'm just going to quickly, just from your left in this building, all the way to your left, I'm just going to, my head's going to move through this place, and you would just say, I'm, I don't know Jesus. I'm lost. I am in I am living in death, and I need Jesus because he gave his life for me. If that's you, and you just want to receive the Lord today, would you just raise your hand up so I can agree with you? My eyes are going to move through this crowd right now. I'm coming from the far left of this room all the way through, and my head's going to be moving. Yeah. Coming right through. Yes, sir. I see you. Good. Coming through. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? I'm coming through the middle section. Yeah, good. Far right. Far right. That you say, I need the Lord in my life. Good. For those of you that received uh, Jesus today, would you just just let him in, just invite him into your heart and invite him into your life? Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for all those that raised their hands. I pray that, God, they would understand who you are, that they would believe that you're the Son of God. And I pray that they would follow you. And, Lord, I ask you for this church that, God, we would fulfill your dream, the dream that you have in your heart for this church, not my dream, not anybody sitting out here, but, Lord Jesus, your dream, your goal, your plan, your future for us. We submit to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over here on the right, see this handsome young man standing over there? That is Pastor John Haywood, and John is uh, heading up a new ministry for those people that have received Jesus. Last year, we had 80-some people. We, we started late in the game last year. We had 80-some people go through our New Believers class. And so we really want to try to make sure we get everybody. And so while worship's going on or even when service ends, if you receive the Lord today, just walk over to Pastor John. There's a great room right there. It's couches. It's very nice. And he just wants to talk with you, give you a Bible, pray with you, answer any questions that he can. And if he doesn't know, he'll figure out the answers later and help you. And this is a great ministry. And then right over here is our prayer team. If you have needs in your life, you just need somebody to pray with you, they'll pray with you. Okay, it's 12.15. We're early. We're 15 minutes early. Again, I just want you to mark that down. (laughs) And so because we're 15 minutes early and we will beat the Baptist to the restaurant, let's take five minutes before before we end. Let's take five minutes and let's worship the Lord with the gratitude of what we just heard about that he purchased salvation for us and it's ours and we're his sons and daughters and he has great promise for us in future. Let's stand and worship the Lord together.